the inability to digest the milk due to the destruction of the lactase enzyme due to heat processing. So sorry to get too technical for everybody out there, but uh, good question. Marshall in Oklahoma, you're on the air. Go ahead with your question, please, sir. Hey, how are y'all? Hey, doing great, man. Good deal. Um, I just wanted to make a statement that, uh, you know, th there's farmers out there, as, as long as they, they know that we want the milk and we seek them out, then, you know, they're, they're probably more than likely to, uh, to provide us what we'll be asking them for as long as we, you know, we, we find them and ask them. Um, and I guess my question would be, is there any tips that, that y'all would have for, you know, finding a local farmer that would be able to provide you with, with fresh milk and, and other fresh produce and things? Uh, you want to take that, Liz? Go ahead. Sure. There's a wonderful website called realmilk.com, and it's a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation, and they list by location, by state, all the raw milk providers within that area, or at least all the ones who are willing to be listed. And if you don't see anybody near you, or if you're in a state that prohibits the sale of raw milk, you can also look up on the Weston A. Price Foundation website for the local chapter leaders and contact them directly because often they will have additional information. You know, I want to speak to that too. Part of the issue here is that as the federal government and even state governments in California, for example, when they go after more raw, raw milk farmers, it has uh, it sends a message that if you try to do this, you're going to be arrested at gunpoint and you're going to find your yourself in court. So it <laughs> suppresses that entire activity by farmers. And that is by design, of course. Any comments on that, Liz? Well, yeah, if, if you do go that route, and especially if you need to call a chapter leader about it, you want to just make sure you let them know as much about you as possible, because right now what happens is FDA, you know, I don't know if Jonathan spoke about this on your last segment, but the FDA has actually been putting um, undercover spy people into buying clubs. Infiltrators, yeah, spies. Infiltrators, right. And so, you know, people who, farmers, they want to know their customers and they want to know that they're not an undercover spy coming to try to shut them down. So people, and especially the people who, who connect consumers to the farmers, they need to know as well so that they feel safe saying, okay, yeah, this person you can sell milk to, or you can have them in your buying club. You know, I'm just astounded by just listening to this myself, sitting, sitting here in the command center of InfoWars, how little the mainstream public knows about any of this. The hoax media refuses to cover it. People aren't taught the difference between pasteurized milk versus fresh milk. They don't even know pasteurized milk is filthy. They don't even know it has pus in it or blood or feces. They don't know this. They've, nobody's ever told them this information. So spread the word on this, folks. Get the word out about this video clip once it's up on YouTube and spread the word about this show so people are better informed. Uh, thank you for your question there, sir. Let's go to Ronnie in Texas. You're on the air with Liz Reitzig. Go ahead, please. We proceed. Thank you, sir. And I just wanted to uh, say uh, it's it's I truly believe that absolute freedom for farmers is the key to life on our garden planet. And, of course, your uh, wonderful movement with the milk is a real clear who can deny the the righteousness of where you're going. And uh, what I'm trying to say is that I, I see it as a concept, uh, potentially is helping to solve uh, the entire planet of, of death cult and all the rest of it in reorient ourselves back to a more living, celebrating life uh, uh, by allowing family farms to exist and encouraging them and organic farming and less Monsanto or Monsanto or whatever <laughs> right. you want to call it. Yeah. And, and and Ron, so, this is, uh, Ronnie, uh, this is Ronnie Reeferseed, right? The, you got it. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, Thank you. Yeah, I've heard you on the show many times. Let me ask you a question. So do you see these strong parallels then between between raw milk freedom and, and let's say, industrial hemp freedom, just farming freedom? I mean, what other examples do you see out there of those? Boy, that is such a great point because there are there's really no limit to the uh, – we can build houses with hemp products. And, and yeah. I mean, hemp is an incredibly strong fiber and not to mention the – the literally thousands of years of research that have been going on to the medicinal or the flowering part of it, but the, either the flowering or just the male hemp plant is, is incredibly beneficial and been used for, like I said, eons. I think absolutely, it's, it's, it, it's real medicine. Living milk is a type of medicine too. In fact, do you have a question, Ronnie, for Liz? Uh, she's she's uh, our guest right now. Do you have a question for? Her? Well, I was uh, specifically I was uh, asking her opinion if if she also saw the correlation between the. Absolute freedom for farmers. I mean, uh, I was just trying to expand that 
she's obviously one huge part of that. And I was just trying to make the point that it's not only, you know, for, uh, well, it promotes peace and, and, and it ends war and ends killing people with, you know, all these uh, evil chemicals and uh, uh, pesticides. And I mean, that's, that's right. Um, together. All these things are not unrelated. I mean, you're exactly right, Ronnie. I'm, and by the way, good, good to meet you on the air here. Uh, Liz, can you speak to that? Why food freedom is essential for peace and abundance on our planet? Well, wow, that's certainly um, that's certainly an avalanche there. But yeah, it, it is because, you know, when we have that that freedom to engage directly with the producer or farmer of our choice, I mean, that opens up worlds that don't exist right now and that can exist. And I, I, I really see this whole issue of food freedom and raw milk kind of being the catalyst for it as this is like a gateway into the rest of the freedoms. Because and, and, once you realize you can, you can in fact, safely engage directly with farmers, like that just opens up a whole new realm, a whole new paradigm of freedom. I think also the, the, the flip side to that is that the GMO food and the processed food and the dead food is really the food of enslavement. That's yeah. the food of, of war, the food of, of conflict, the food of being dumbed down. And yeah. so, you know, you can choose which, what kind of society you want to build based on what kind of food you eat. Would you agree with that, Liz? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I mean, it's very telling because the products that are used to grow um, GMO crops are the leftover products from war. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? Is, well, is, well, the, the, the pesticides and the herbicides that they spray on the, on the um, GMO crops are derived from chemical agents used in World War II. Yeah, you're right. Well, chemotherapy is as well. The same derived yeah. from the same thing. Ig farben, um, the the chemotherapy agents are a type of poison. By the way, let me. I've just been handed some breaking news. I want to mention this very quickly, and then we'll continue with you, Liz. Uh, FEMA puts out contract for emergency camps to house quote displaced citizens. This is an article by Paul Joseph Watson. It's posted on Infowars.com right now. So go to Infowars, check that out. I haven't read this article yet, but uh, glancing over it here, it, it says the camps will be able to service up to 2,000 people at one time. It also indicates that the FEMA camp operations will be positioned in the context of social service. Yeah, we're going to help you. Come to our little camp. You can come in, but you can never leave. That's the kind of FEMA camp that they're setting up. Now, getting back to our callers, I apologize for that interruption there, Liz. We've got Marlon from Michigan on the phone. Marlon, go ahead with your question for Liz. Hi, hi. Yes, I was just wondering uh, if uh, you have uh, had any uh, uh, exposure to camel milk uh, and what's happening on that line. I'm actually a uh, camel farmer, and uh, we're having some uh, really amazing uh, benefits that we're seeing. Okay, your, your phone's kind of breaking up there, and I assume you're serious about this. It sounds kind of funny to m maybe to many people. Liz, you, have you heard of any camel milk farmers out there? I have. I've heard of them, and I've actually been to a farm that, that has camels that they milk. However, I have not personally had any of the camel milk, but I, I'm, I'm eager to try it. It sounds delightful, and I've heard that it makes a very interesting fermented milk product. Well, that's that's something new that I learned. Thank you for that for that call, sir, Marlon. Uh, very interesting. Sorry about cutting you off. Your your phone was was very staticky. Um, about that story, the FEMA uh, announcement that's on Infowars.com right now, I missed a key point that the solicitation calls for the camps to be ready for occupancy within 72 hours. Now, I don't know if that means 72 hours from now or 72 hours from some activation alert or some announcement. But clearly, the time scale on this is accelerating. The FEMA camps are cranking up for operations. You can only imagine what that is in anticipation of something perhaps is coming down the line. Uh, again, sorry for the interruption, Liz. We've got uh, about a minute left in this segment. Time for one more call. Uh, Bregan in Wisconsin. You're on You're on the phone. We're almost out of time, so go ahead quickly, please. Hi, Mike and Liz. Um, I actually own a restaurant in Madison, Wisconsin, and I've spoken with Max and uh, Vernon in the past, and I think I spoke with you actually last fall, Liz. Um, uh, and we use we use organic products in our restaurant. Um, and I was wondering if Mike could, could talk about Justice Patrick J. Fiedler and the broader issue of um, food rights and your inherent right to actually grow your own food. And I know Liz was following that as well. 
Well, let me put that to Liz since she's our guest right now. Liz, you want to go ahead and address that in 30 seconds? Uh -huh. That's tough. Well, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but we definitely have our rights and included in that is procuring our own food. And if you're interested in learning more about it, we're having a ah, we got to go to break. Sorry, oh. Liz. Okay. Sorry to cut you off. Stay with <laughs> us. We'll be right back after this break. Up our interview with Liz Reitzig from rawmilkfreedomriders.com. I want to encourage all the info warriors out there to go to that website, check out the event details. That's coming up, what, uh, 11 a.m. this Friday in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Please be there. Be part of this history in the making where the Declaration of Food Independence is going to be released. And I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about that, uh, uh, that statement, that announcement, that declaration here on infowars.com, as well as my website, Natural News. We'll be covering it at both places. Some other breaking news I want to be sure to get uh, to you today. I promised this earlier. The FAA has set a, a timetable now for allowing drones to be in the skies above America. September 30th, 2015 is the day that the nation's skies will be open to drones of, of even big drones. Now, the first step towards that comes in just 90 days, 90 days from today. When police, firefighters, and other civilian first response agencies can start flying drones weighing no more than 4.4 pounds. And then by May 2013, that's going to be expanded to drones weighing less than 55 pounds. And then the full integration of, of drones, they, that's, those are their words, full integration of drones. Sounds very nice and peaceful, doesn't it? Into U.S. airspace is September 30th, 2015. So we are going to be inundated with spy drones looking into our backyards, looking into our gardens, watching every little move that we do in our lives. Now, some other very important information to bring you. This is an article published in mcnews.com. It's called The Sting. It reveals that police all over the country are setting up fake construction zones and then writing speeding tickets. One fake construction zone in Washington state was able to write 76 speeding tickets Every Well, one ticket every two minutes for a total of $8,000 per hour being collected by the police there. The idea is working so well for these broke local governments that it's being set up in Denver, Colorado. There's a fake construction zone set up at the exit from the Denver International Airport. They trick you into thinking that it's a 45 mile an hour zone. In fact, it, there's, a, there's a little sign there, it drops to 25 miles an hour and it says fines are doubled because this is a construction zone, but there's no construction there. There's just a bunch of cops there waiting to write tickets by entrapping you in a false construction zone, a face construction zone. Also in Dallas, Texas, an investigation there has found that traffic cameras are being combined with shortened duration of yellow lights to make sure that you run the yellow light or you run the red light effectively because the yellow light is shortened in order to generate revenue on that camera. At one camera, they generated 9,407 tickets worth over $700,000 between January and August of last year. So that's what it's come to, folks. Forget your freedoms, forget law. It's all revenue generation. Just another way to trap you into paying more of your money to the state. Now, I've got one more thing to announce. I just finished a mini documentary called False Environmentalism. And I want to roll the first 60 seconds of that for you so you get a look at that. You can find this on YouTube.com. Just search for False Environmentalism. Go ahead and roll that. I want you to see it. Are you fed up with false environmentalism that says we have to stop breathing in order to save the planet? Here are five things you can do right now to really save the environment without giving up your freedom or surrendering to oppressive government mandates. And these five things are probably not what you think. Many people, for example, think that changing their light bulbs to compact fluorescent lights will save the planet, and they applaud the government's light bulb mandates. But CFLs are loaded with toxic mercury. And when you throw them away, they release mercury directly into local landfills and water aquifers. Or you might think you could save the planet by driving the much coveted Toyota Prius. But a Prius is made with electric motors and batteries, which are themselves made out of rare earth metals extracted from some of the dirtiest mining operations All right there. in the world. Uh, check that out on YouTube.com. Thank you for joining us today. This is Mike Adams.